Welcome back to Conversations with Cabral, where I am thrilled to be able to introduce you to Dr. Nicole LaPera, known as, better known as, the holistic psychologist. Dr. Nicole LaPera is an expert at breaking down the ego and childhood-based subconscious programming that is holding you back from living your best and happiest life. We go through why the ego is created, why it's actually there to protect you, what to do to look for it, become more self-aware, and the three steps needed in order to heal your inner child, and yes, we all have one, in order to live a life of just greater joy, greater playfulness, and greater happiness. Check Check out today's interview with myself and the holistic psychologist right now. Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Dr. Nicole LaPera, welcome to the show. It is great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabral, for having me. So I'm looking forward to introducing your work if they don't, if my community doesn't already know about you uh, and all the great things that you're doing in the field of psychology and really helping us to... I would say remove a lot of the childhood trauma that many people have carried forward towards their adulthood, usually usually unknowingly. So before we get into all of that today, and it really is going to be absolutely fantastic of a topic, I would love for you to be able to explain your title as a holistic psychologist and what exactly that means and how do you go about helping people? Yeah, absolutely. So the title actually, Stephen, I'm holistic psychologist is something that I've evolved into as a result of my own personal journey on this on this here earth planet life plane um, and also uh, based on my clinical work. So historically, um, on the human side of things, I am someone who's always had an experience of anxiety. For as long as I can remember, as little as I remember back being, um, I was the scared child, pretty much afraid of anything and everything that could happen bad. Um, in the world. So that's just an experience that I felt I was inborn into. Um, I saw very similar anxiety in my family unit, um, in my mom and my sister in particular. Um, So of course, I just thought I had that genetic chip and that was going to be part of my story. Um, As I began to develop and evolve and high school age came and went, you know, that time where everyone starts to ask, well, what are you going to do when you grow up? Um, I very much was interested in the human mind in particular, what made people like me, what made them different than me, and just really wanted to understand people, probably because on a deep level, I felt different, not connecting um, to them. So I think a lot of us, you know, are driven into the profession for different reasons. And for me, it was kind of an intuitive next step in my journey. So flash forward many years of school. I had the successful private practice. I had the clients that came in and saw me week after week after week. I was living my own life, of course, personally, in relationships, out of relationships. And one word kept coming up um, in my own life and also in my client work and kind of started to haunt me a little bit as trying to be the professional in the room, helping people create change. And that word was stuck. Um, I started to feel as I entered my 30s, incredibly stuck in my own self, in my own way of being. At that point, gathering insights, you know, coming to awarenesses that, oh, this thing doesn't really get me. When I act this way, I don't get the, you know, the, the payoff that I want and I'm seeing consequences in my life. And long story short, I started to see the same pattern in all of my clients. So after going through what I talk a lot about, if you follow my work, um, a period of time that I really understand now is my dark night of the soul. Um, when physical, emotional, and spiritual, you know, symptoms and emptinesses and every just thing just kind of came bubbling to the surface. Um, I went online. I think the first place a lot of us go to, um, to at first it was an attempt to diagnose what was wrong with me. Why am I not getting better? Why am I struggling so much? And in that deep dive online, Stephen, I just came upon 
all of this wealth of information that was starting to tell me a fuller story about a human being, a human experience. In school, I learned a lot about the mind, um, you know, kind of what makes us think and, you know, kind of start like chopping us off really from the head down. And when I, when I dove into my own research, I started to find out all of the effects of physiological imbalances, of nervous system dysregulation, and how they really do play a role in keeping us stuck. I also meant that kind of indescribable entity that I like to call a soul, um, that kind of thing that makes us human that none of us can really define. And I really started to understand in my own research the role that that might be playing and the role of disconnection between that really core true self. And so flash forward, a lot of research, a lot of study, and obviously a lot of implementation of new tools. And what I really began to understand is my stuck points were very similar to the stuck points that I was seeing in my clients. And I was coming to understand a, a more full picture, what I began to then label as holistic um, a more unified picture of, of humanity and of human experience. And obviously then very shortly after began sharing those theories online, began seeing just the incredible universal really resonance, um, people really beginning to come to the same awarenesses. And at that point, I really took a hard shift in terms of the way I was working, began to phase out kind of working clinically in that old sense and really began to embody and work more holistically in terms of tools. That's great to hear. And it's, it's always amazing, you know, whatever natural health specialty you may be in is that, uh, you, you learn very quickly, I think. And, and you certainly said that is that you're not your genetics. They certainly play a part. You know, you can be predisposed to certain things, but you're not destined to your genetic code. And the other thing is what we learn, uh, in terms of our education and textbooks is great, but it's really just the start. It's the foundation. And then you start working with real people and you realize, well, there's some disconnect between what I learned in school and actually help, how to help people heal at the deepest level. Because I think we learn a more surface level in school. And it's only when you begin to study not textbooks, but actually the works of other authors and other maybe people from a hundred. I, like, I love to go back to like the 1800s, 1900s, and a lot of the traditional naturopaths, they were called natural hygienists, and, and they use psychology. They use basically the whole person. And it's something we lose now. Because even when you become a naturopathic doctor, and there's so many great naturopathic doctors out there, you're, you're not using the green medicine, we call it, but you're still not working on the person themselves. You're looking to work on the cholesterol, the blood pressure, whatever it might be. And it's understanding that there are many triggers to dis-ease in the body, and sometimes it's stress. And that stress has a much deeper component. So, um, I'm, you know, it's fantastic that we have people like yourself in this field. And also that, um, yes, I love one-on-one -on -one work, but it's also now one-to-many. You would never be able to reach millions of people. And not that it's bad. I mean, again, we, we need all types of practitioners, but now you're able to influence the lives of, you know, millions of people through your work. So it's, it's great to see. So the first thing that I want to really get into with you, and it's a topic that I think is the foundation for why we might not be living our best life right now in terms of overall happiness with where we're at, no matter where we're at in any situation, and that is the ego. So if you could explain it from your perspective of what the ego is and you know how it's developed, that would be, I think that would be fantastic. A good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more because we live with the ego or an aspect of it, kind of the voice inside our head, the very patterned way of being day in and day out. And a lot of us, that, that ego um, that is stored in the subconscious part of our mind that I'll go into a little bit deeper in a second, that is the reason why that word I was referencing earlier, stuck. Um, a lot of the reasons why we're stuck is because we're stuck kind of repeating those patterns that were imprinted and stored very early on in life. So what is the ego? We first want to understand, you know, when we are human and we are an infant, we come to this planet, however it is you believe we get here, we are in a complete state of dependency, meaning we cannot meet our own needs really in any way. We are the one mammal that needs kind of caretakers of a sort. And of course, our caretaking environments look different. You know, the whom's we were raised about and around and with are very different in parts of the world, et cetera. However, 
we are, if we want to break down, and I speak very simplistically just for understanding purposes. So if we want to break down the core sets of needs, I really identify three major sets of needs that we have, all humans have and share. They are the needs of our physical body to keep our organism, the shell that we're in alive. They are the needs of our emotional body. Um, emotions, I believe, are energies, hormones, kind of the physiological reactions that we label anger, happiness, sadness, etc. We have emotional needs of our body. And then that third category, again, I believe that we have a, a soul or a spiritual entity and we have those bases. So we come in a state of dependency and then we are interpersonal we actually succeeded as a species being able to join up in you know clans and groups and tribes if you will to help us get those needs met so our first smallest group right is our usually our family of origin whatever that might look like and we begin to get our needs met then typically in relationship with other people and we are very adaptive so to keep our need you know being met with our mother our caregiver our father whoever that is we learn how to show up in that relationship to continue to ensure that we are fed, you know, our physical body is cared for, our core spiritual or emotional needs to be seen, heard, understood, connected to. And again, this is where we begin to adapt. So before we know it, we learn how to show up. So I'll use myself as an example. I learned that I had a lot, there was a lot of stress. Talk about stress. I very much relate to that. A lot of my stuckness was because of the physiological stuck of stress that I was having in my body, nervous system reaction. So I learned how to show up, say, in relationship with my mother to get praised, to feel loved. And that, for me, was performing, what I call. I learned how to be a good girl, to show my mom the A I got, right? And that got me praised, helped me feel connected to mom. So why am I talking about all of this when we're talking about ego? The way we learn about ourselves begins through that information that we're gathering in those earliest relationships. And the simplest definition of ego that I come up with is our story of us. How do we imagine ourselves to be? What are the traits that we ascribe to ourselves? There was a time where I was a shy, scared, anxious little girl, right? What are the ways that we are in the world? What are our daily habits and patterns? All of this kind of gets formed into what I define as this story of us. And then unfortunately, we grow, we change, we evolve, we mature, our relationships change. We might even leave the physical location of those home environments, yet we don't, we still carry that story. And we filter our daily current experiences into adulthood through that story of us. And that typically is the, when we have reactivity, emotional reactivity, a lot of times it's because that story of us is being challenged by someone else's opinions, beliefs, way of being in the world. So we're reactive. It also limits us, in my opinion, because there's a whole other story of who we are that is possibly more accurate or more complete um, than those earliest narratives that we've formed. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great definition of looking at the ego itself, how it's formed. Would you I mean, why do you think it is developed? I mean, part of it is, and I think you began to touch on it. Would you say it's in the beginning, it serves to, to keep us safe and to keep us secure, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like you have those first two levels. And without those two, you can't ascend to that spiritual base level or, you know, go after all of your goals if you don't feel like you're in a safe, secure space. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm really happy that you clarified that, Stephen, and brought up the concept of safety because that's an integral component of it. So the ego is stored in the part of the mind that you and I reference, the subconscious part of our mind that's the deepest recess of our mind. One of the impulses that governs that is a drive for that which is familiar. So those stories that we rehearse, that who I think I am, that way of being that I think I am, that becomes that familiar autopilot that for evolutionary purposes, we're driven to repeat. Because according to our subconscious, that which is predictable is safer. Even if what comes next is maybe what one might define a bad and negative, if you will, consequence, I know what it is. 
And to a human, the uncertainty of not knowing is one of the most threatening things because what could be on the other side could be something worse. So we are driven to repeat. So I, I'm happy you clarify because a lot of times now when I hear the ego reference or talked about, there's a lot of mis understanding that I believe happens. Um, one of which is that it's a bad thing and that we're a bad person or shame, we should be shameful. You know, if we have an ego, there's not a human on this planet that I have yet to meet that does not have an ego. It actually was formed, was formed very early on as our best adaptation, our best attempt at keeping ourselves safe. And remember, I'm just going to repeat this again, because this is really important for listeners to understand safe means familiar. Because sometimes it's not logical, the patterns that our ego keeps us stuck in. And many of us can have a litany of reasons and negative consequences. And some of us hear them from our friends and loved ones, right? And I share this because something you and I, I think, resonate on. There's no reason to be ashamed if you have an ego, if you see yourself reacting from that space of ego, if you see yourself, you know, repeating the same patterns, even though you quote unquote know better. A lot of us make that jump to assume we're broken, we're bad. This means we can't change. And I'm going to be here, and I believe your work does that very beautifully, which is to say no. There's a very real physiological, nervous system, emotional, condition-based, whatever it is, reason why you're stuck repeating those patterns. It's not because you're broken. We are actually, all of us humans, are patterned to repeat that which is familiar for evolutionary reasons. Yeah, I want to restate that because I've actually never heard it referenced as safe equals familiar. And that makes so much sense because I always refer to it as the comfort zone, but it's not like you're uncomfortable even in your comfort zone, but at least you know it. And so you know it, it's familiar, which that makes a whole lot of sense. And and you see it. I mean, people are in bad relationships and choose the wrong person over and over and over. And, and they already know that this isn't the right person for them, yet they don't know why they keep meeting the same type of person and having the same type of relationship. And they know that it's wrong, but it's familiar. And that is what keeps them feeling like, well, I don't know anything else. At least I know how to deal with this. And so that, that begins to make a lot of sense, even in my practice, meaning you know, we, we can help people get well. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we re, I always say there is an answer. You're able to find the answer as long as you're willing to work the different variables. However, that doesn't mean you won't relapse in the future if you haven't worked on the person yourself, meaning that if you identify as the victim of Hashimoto's, the victim of your autoimmune issue, the victim of your digestive issues, well, you're going to continue to move back there because you don't know how to live life as this happy, vibrant person. You basically need to relearn. You, you need to learn how to do that for the first time as an adult. And it seems like there might be a wiring based issue because I saw your explanation a little bit differently, more from a, a medical based perspective. But we have our physical body, which is just basically the vehicle that moves us through life. But then we have the nervous system which connects it to our brain, which might be, we'll say, the spiritual side of the conscious side and subconscious, but that's what talks together. So what happens is if our brain is talking to our, our organs or our nervous system through the adrenals, thyroid, whatever it might be, you're going to keep getting off kilter every time you begin to relapse. And so that's how we see it from my perspective until we begin to create a new familiar, right? I mean, until so you have to create something now that's more familiar. And I'd love to be able to go through that with you. But first, before we do that, did I, did I get that correct? Or where, where did I go wrong? No, that's beautiful. I have a big smile on my face because the nervous system is incredibly pivotal in what mental wellness in all wellness, really, because of that bi-directional communication and maybe tri-directional, if you will, kind of acknowledging that there is that other conscious awareness, soul-based, spiritual entity that maybe we call it resides in the mind, wherever, you know, you want to say it is, but you know, that that's really beautiful. And, and a lot of us, I'm happy you shouted out the nervous system in particular, because a lot of us are stuck in different states of nervous system activation as our attempt to reclaim safety and security because that's what our nervous system is meant to do. It's meant to have something stressful that externally or internally happens to us to essentially metabolize the stress and to allow then our body to move back to baseline. And for many reasons, some of us like myself were stuck in that 
always kind of a flight fight reaction of the sympathetic where I can't turn off. I feel like there's, I'm always waiting for the next shoe to drop. I'm hyper vigilant. And then some of us get stuck, I think in that hypo in that parasympathetic where I have no energy, no, uh, you know, um, cognition, no drive to do anything. I'm completely apathetic. And while, you know, again, we're talking about all the stuff that can happen, you know, if we're stuck in that state of nervous system activation, again, messages coming from our mind down. We also have, while on the one hand, you know, listeners might think, oh, my nervous system, I, my, I can't control that. It's really incredible to start to learn all of the different daily tools, breath work being a huge one that I go on and on about that actually can help us develop that nervous system flexibility and actually can from the top down or if the spirit down, right, begin to affect change in the physical body. And then we can create the wellness. And a lot of us are stuck because our physiology is working against sometimes our very insightful, aware, you know, kind of higher self that knows better. We're just, our body keeps us stuck in that same loop. So you very beautifully, you know, I think are shouting out the main player, which is that, that nervous system, a nerve that a lot of, you know, clinicians are finally beginning to talk about the polyvagal and that kind of, that really main highway of communication is really what we want to understand as our stuck point and then harness into our healing. And we, we do talk a lot about the nervous system in our community. It's such an, it's overlooked. I mean, it is the, it's that bi-directional or tri-directional, as you said, uh, vehicle that enables whatever type of change that you want. And um, I absolutely agree that there's a lot of different things the biohacking community does for sympathetic, parasympathetic, but there's nothing more powerful than your breath because it brings you to awareness, which I know that we'll be talking about in a moment because the first time you go back to your breath, you realize, okay, you might be in control of this. You might be in control of at least your breathing. And if you can control your breathing, well, what else can you control? So I, I really want to get into that, but let's give, I would love to give some examples that you've seen from your practice and your work of, okay, so we have the ego and it's essentially wired into our subconscious. We should probably talk a little bit about the subconscious for people that don't know what that is, because essentially most people agree that 90, 95% of all of our thoughts, feelings, then what lead to actions is subconscious based. That leads to then our life. So if we can touch a little bit about the subconscious, what is that? Where is it stored? I don't think anybody really knows, but let's take a stab at that. And then also, um, how does this play out? How does the ego play out in some examples in everyday life? And then we'll begin to that healing process of how we can then reverse it. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the subconscious, again, I referred to it earlier as kind of a, a lower region of our brain. Um, there's a, many different kind of brain areas that you know, contribute to that, which is the subconscious. The main ones that I'm typically referencing are, you know, the amygdala, the seat of our emotions and, and the hippocampus and kind of the memory center. And we now know that those two, again, very simply are interconnected or communicating, which is why a lot of times our memories are very emotionally driven. We remember the bad things or the very positive events because those two kind of connect and help us have memory. So that's kind of the house where the subconscious is. Using a computer analogy that I know we're all, you know, very intimately friend, uh, aware of and, you know, kind of navigating in the whole virtual sphere, the way we uh, uh, meet our subconscious each and every day is through the programs, quote unquote, that are stored in there. Um, we become very automated as humans. And on the one hand, we're very grateful for our, the power of our mind to be able to automatize life. Because if we had to wake up every day and consciously, intentionally remember how to do all of the things with being human, I mean, this might sound silly to even consider, but how do I raise my body from bed? And what do I do now once it's up? You know, do I go and brush it? To right. So all of that we learned and we, we've become very habitual to this extent that we don't even have to use caloric energy or mental attention and it happens. It's that phenomenon that we're all familiar with where, I don't know where we're driving these days to work, wherever, right? You're there and you don't really remember the route you took because maybe you were rehearsing the fight you had with your partner that morning or you're stressing out about the meeting you have, you're headed to with your boss. I know I've lived the majority of my life in that state of autopilot where, and we get very good at it. So if you would have met me a decade ago, you wouldn't have known how disconnected, dissociated that my resting state really was 
because my autopilot, I could have a full conversation with you, Stephen. I was still going about my day. I was still from external, you know, kind of viewpoints, very successful. I had a home over my, a roof over my head. I had a job I went to, right? So from the outside, everything appeared as a lot of us can, that those programs are working. Um, but when you really tune in, I think you begin to understand how they're not. So we need that. If we had to think every day how to be human, we would completely, I joke and I say there's steam coming out of our ears. We would be debilitated. However, the issue is, and again, we meet that autopilot each and every time when we go to create a new habit, right? When we want to do something different because we know this old choice doesn't serve us anymore, we meet that autopilot when we feel, feel what I call resistance, a pull to come back into that familiar. For some of us, it can be cognitive, thought-based. All of the reasons why I just had this happen to me last week. I tried to re-engage um, a sitting practice of meditation that I got a bit away from in terms of my daily habit. I went to sit and my mind told me, I know how helpful for me a sitting meditation practice is. My mind sat there and told me all of the other things I should do in this next five minutes as opposed to sitting. So some of us, it could be the arguments that our mind is telling us. Some of us, it could just be a indescribable kind of agitation feeling. Some of us might even put words to it and say, I just don't feel like me. I just feel a little bit different. And when, if, and when that resistance is strong enough, a lot of us tend to find ourselves over time, maybe not immediately, maybe two weeks into that new habit, we go back into those old habitual ways because we've come to identify with the behaviors, with the thoughts and with the feelings that those thoughts and behaviors produce in us as who we are. And when we start to evolve into a new way of being, it at surface feels uncomfortable. It just doesn't feel like we're used to. So that resistance kind of gets imploded in. And then before we know it, we're making those same choices. So I think that's a really big illustration um, of why change is hard and really of the daily activity of that subconscious pull back to that, the word in science that we think of is homeostasis. Not, however, much of the homeostasis that much of us, many of us are living in isn't that balanced, peaceful state. Um, it could be, you know, I was very homeostatic around stress. So when I wasn't feeling stress, this is another example of how this comes to play. I could be sitting in what, if you would have spoke to me logically, let me voice this first. All I would have said to you and any human around me that knew me is I just, peace, man. I just want peace, calm, and freedom in my life. That's all I really kind of cognitively thought that my soul needs on this journey. However, if I had a moment of peace, right, and say I was alone sitting on my couch, so nothing seemingly is bothering me, I would notice one of two things. If I was alone, I would just feel an indescribable agitation inside where I might deal with that agitation. I might get up and clean, my, clean the house or kind of discharge, but I wasn't really settled feeling. So before you know it, I was up in a frenzy of agitated energy, taking care of things. The way this would then play out in my relationships, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, because my baseline was stress, if I had a seemingly peaceful moment and say there was a partner that I was with next to me, that, right, that peace, my pull towards stress, wait, wait, I'm used to a family motto of mine, I should mention, has, is always something. So I kind of internalize that, that mantra. I'm sitting on my couch in a seemingly peaceful moment. My partner's next to me. There's no conflict. However, right, that doesn't feel comfortable. That doesn't feel familiar to me. So what then I could do is I might start to pick interpersonally. I might bring up that thing that you did or you said yesterday, partner, that, you know what, I didn't really like. And now before you know it, I might have agitated, right, my interpersonal experience into that stress-based familiar that I'm used to. So I use those examples, and this could be with anything that has become our familiar, um, really becoming conscious of those, those patterns and you know, understanding that a lot of those patterns are housed in that subconscious or the result of childhood experiences, often painful ones, and then be, have become the living adaptations that pull us back into those familiar ways of being. Yeah, that's great. I love that uh, analogy too. It's it's always something, right? Because uh, many people grow up that way, and 
you find yourself saying the same thing that as an adult, and you're like, "Well, where did where did that come from?" All, all of a sudden, I'm my parents. I'm you know, I'm I'm repeating that again, even if you know that's not what you want in your life, but you've created this subconscious pattern, you know, and it's basically this is the loop that you're in, and you're destined to repeat it until you begin to rewire. And I would say that the re- rewiring part, which we'll talk about, can be uncomfortable in the beginning, and it's because there is this. Uh, as they say, cognitive dissonance from what you know to be true to what you hope to be true, but you don't know if that's true yet and you have never lived it. So it's like, well, how do you get there? We need to bridge that gap. And just, you know, one example that, you know, I can, I can share with people myself and I'm always open about my own kind of journey is that uh, for me, it was always, uh, it was always having to be the best, like be, the top, be number one, whatever it was. And I didn't know why I was doing that because sure, it fed the ego, but there was something like, why do I need to? And then as I go back and I look, well, you know, it was a community. It was a culture of judgment. You know, that was a big thing is like, you had to be good. You had to do this. You weren't worthy enough, whatever it might be. And so basically, I mean, for most people, it comes down to, if you do this, you'll be safe, you'll be secure, or you'll be loved. And so we're always trying to, to search that out in some very strange ways. Like, and I would love for even to I- expand upon that a little bit because you don't have to be repeating what you did when you were younger. You can change those patterns as an adult to do adult things, yet you're still searching for the same thing on the inside. And it's really, you know, it's, it's just becoming aware, which I know that's the three parts. I don't want to, to really get into your work without having you explain it to a better degree. But I would love you just to talk a little bit about that. Is it the safety, security, love that we're after? Are there more emotions that we really need at a deeper level that we're seeking out in some strange and different ways? Um, is there more to it than that? Yeah, so the the three that you'll hear me cite, um, and I put these back to those three kind of camps of needs that I referenced earlier. So in the kind of spiritual, emotional camp, quite universally, you know, I find we have three core needs and they are to be seen, to be heard, and to have the space to authentically express, to just simply be who we are. Um, And I think all of us humans share that desire. And I believe to a very large, great extent, and all children and infants, if you, those of us who have children in our life, right, you can see those kind of moments of that pure authenticity and play and how they express before you know it, right? Again, those conditioned relationship, those ways of being that a very tuned child picks up on to make, to ensure that they remain connected with mom and dad, aunt and uncle, or whomever the caregivers are those then become the replicated applications. And usually emotionally, it's around that desire to just, we want to just be who we are um, fully, authentically, and freely. However, that's usually where we begin to make modifications. Um, We start to learn through sometimes direct messaging feedback, right? You know, you are a person, you know, little Johnny or, or Janet, whomever, who does this or doesn't do this, or we do or don't do this in families or Some of us are imprinted by our religious institutions. You know, if you're Catholic, you do this and not this. And if you're, right? And so the list goes on. Sometimes it's more indirect where we're not maybe, you know, given directives or direction, but we learn that when, you know, if we're someone who's artistic as a child and when we're dancing around, we learn that, you know, mom, dad, or whomever kind of isn't that interested or, you know, kind of leaves the room and they're just not, you know, their attention isn't given to you. However, When you bring home those A's, you know, I may or may not be talking about myself in a little bit, right? When I bring home that A and I say, mom, here's my A, right? Now it's on the fridge and everyone tells me, you know, I'm a really good little child. So sometimes it's just through behavior. We might have a parent who's so uncomfortable with their own feelings that when we're having our own feeling as a child, right? oftentimes it's not ill-intentional by our parents. Half the time it's unconscious and what they think they're doing in the moment is is not how it's being experienced. So this could also look like emotions in general. You have an emotional need. Remember as children, we can't regulate ourselves. You look to that parent and that parent who can't tend with their own emotions, right? Kind of leaves the room or makes the comment of, oh, you're fine. You know, don't worry about that. Not a big deal. 
And again, you then begin to sequester parts of yourself. Okay, I note that mom doesn't like when I'm crying. So before you know it, five years from now, you might not bring tears to mom anymore. So just a couple examples of how all of this, you know, kind of evolves in childhood and, and what we mean when we say we're looking to be seen, heard and understood and the adaptations that go along with that, we're looking to remain connected. That's really what it comes down to. So humans share that universal need and we all are very adaptive. So we all find the ways to, you know, kind of maintain whatever connection we've become familiar with. That's however, as into adulthood, where a lot of us want to begin to do the work to reconnect, maybe first authentically with ourselves, and then be able to evolve our relationships into that safe space where we can be seen, heard, and authentically expressed and hold space for the other, whomever they might be, to be seen, heard, and authentically express themselves. Absolutely. And and one other thing that I would like to get your thoughts on too, is when we are an adult and we're no longer able to get the validation from a partner, uh, or I should say parents or someone that means someone, something to us, what else do we seek out? You know, we talked about, you know, staying in the familiar, but there's so much of, uh, people that say, well, I'm not feeling great right now, or I'm going through the same types of hardships. I don't have a parent to comfort me, whatever it might be. So they might turn to food. They might turn to alcohol. They might turn to other things. That's, that's, a, that's an area that I think I would like to learn more about myself is how does that play out in the psychology? Meaning that, okay, I had a rough day at work. Uh, I'm looking to be consoled and I, I turned to food, even though I know that I shouldn't be doing that. Can you talk a little bit on that topic? Yeah. So just kind of talking about just from a purely psychological perspective, I define those as choices. They're coping, right? Eating, over drinking, drinking in general, all substance use, distraction, the online, porn. I mean, the list goes on. Um, We do a lot of things and we learn to do a lot of things to deal with our emotions. Um, And I see those as kind of the down. So we have the stress, right? To use your language that I also completely agree with. And then we have the question of what are we, what do we do with the stress? How do we cope? How do we deal? How do we metabolize it, neutralize it, allow our body to return back to that homeostatic balance? Um, and a lot of us have learned, again, some of us through direct modeling, you know, you ha- we are learning how to cope with our emotions, that middle need state emotions, right? We're taking in, okay, well, how do the people around us cope with their emotions? So some of us are modeled when I'm sad, you know, our caregivers did this thing or that thing. So I learned, okay, and maybe they even instructed that I do those things when I'm sad. And now I've been modeled um, how to how to deal with, you know, our feelings and our emotions. And a lot of times, um, that's why food is very complicated. Historically, when I was, you know, in my, my old practice, um, the large majority of my clients, even if they didn't come in for any sort of eating-based, you know, issues, quote unquote, if you will, relationship with food came up um, because a lot of times that becomes one of the ways that we are coping um, with our feelings, myself included. I have a history of stress affects me. I don't eat. Um, I get very restrictive, you know, when I'm feeling stress. I also have a history of using substances. You know, when I found marijuana when I was like 13 years old, it felt like a godsend for me at first because it was now something external that I could ingest to further my disconnection or the dissociation that I I was already learning to do through my nervous system response on my own. And now I was introduced to something external that I could take, you know, intendedly and distract myself. Um, So yeah, we want to explore if you are someone who's habitual in, you know, behaviors such as eating, drinking, whatever it is, the internet is a huge, you know, coping tool, quote unquote, that many people are utilizing now. So we want to look at what our patterns are, you know, how have we learned to cope with our emotions and exploring the possibility that sometimes we kind of blur the line and we are then affecting our physical bodies based on the choices that we're um, making to try and soothe our emotional bodies, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we are making, when we are when choosing these coping mechanisms, are we doing it, um, are we doing it for a sense of control? I guess that's, that's the way that I'm putting it. Or are there other reasons as well? So when we, 
reach for the cigarette or the drink or distraction? Is that because we're trying to take control of our emotions or are we just trying to forget it, palliate it, which I guess is a still a sense of control? What, what does that look like from your perspective and your practice? Yeah, I mean, the first word that came to mind when I heard you say that is, um, and it might be via a control mechanism, but we just want to feel better. We just want to feel better. We want relief um, from from what we're feeling. And, you know, a lot of us take um, kind of the immediate, the most immediate route to that relief. We take the most learned route to that relief. And relief looks different, I should add, to while we're having this for each of us. So the thing I do that you know, might have felt relieving to my feelings historically, you know, might not resonate. Um, but I think that's what we're driven to. Um, and especially in childhood when we are largely out of control, because remember, we're dependent. I think control and relief can get kind of mashed up together where it's chicken or the egg kind of conversation. But I have heard a lot of people referring to it as, especially with food, just using that as an example, Food choices, I mean, we can start to make those quite early, even, you know, in toddlerhood when you're like, mm, you know, you decide I don't want that thing and I can tell mom, I'm, you know, close my mouth. And so food and those sort of behaviors, when we're very young and we are largely dependent, we can't leave home. We're not even emotionally savvy enough sometimes to speak, you know, what we, our thoughts to our parents, but we can refuse food or we can sneak food. We can end up in the cookie jar behind mom's back. So a lot of times you'll start to see those patterns um, formed quite early because it is the small areas where we can begin to grab for some control in that largely dependent state of childhood. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know that you've spoken about this and I've really looked into it myself, but it's also the rebellion then as an adult against the not being able to do this and being told exactly what to do. And, and uh, which again, can, can hurt you uh, in the same, in the same mold, I guess, you know, even if it was trying to be protective as a child. So what I'd love to go into now is We've given a pretty good picture of what the ego is, a lot of the patterns we fall into, how we're not always doing what's best for us, but we're doing what's familiar, which keeps us in our comfort zone. So in order for us to be able to, I would say, yes, achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves, but really, I, I mean, I just want people to live to their potential and to enjoy their life. And whatever that means for each individual is very unique. Like you're not supposed to go after anybody's goals. You're supposed to go after what feels right for you. And I don't always know that we know what's right for us until we begin to do this work at removing a lot of the trauma, or as you referred to, the wounded self, where we can then have a better, clearer picture of who it is that we really are. So you you pretty, you pretty make this very succinct in three steps, but of course you can elaborate. But I'd love to take people through these three steps and begin to show everyone, because we all have it, how they can move more towards their greatest potential. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And, you know, I... I I believe that, you know, a large reason why, you know, we're so stuck, it, it really is based around this foundational principle um, of consciousness, which, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about right now, because I think that's, that's where change, you know, really, really occurs. The question I get asked the most, you know, and you can insert whatever context or whatever issue or problem, you know, kind of in this is, you know, how do I know? How do I know if this is the right partner for me? How do I know if this is the right job or the career path for me? How do I know if this is a safe situation for me? How do I know? And like I said, you can insert, um, or, or how do I know if this is my intuition speaking or my, some people might even use that word intuition or my past wounds and experiences. And unfortunately, there is no, you know, systematic, algorithmic, um, you know, kind of one to three steps that we can employ check boxes and decide or determine whether this is my intuition saying it's yes, or whether or not this is my conditioning, you know, if you will, saying it's yes. And Stephen, I get that question all of the time, because we all want to know, you know, we all, I think, have the awareness that there is a greater knowledge, you know, a, an internal wisdom and intuition. Again, we might use that word. I think we're all getting a sense that there is a guidance that somewhere, you know, where is it and how do I have it? Where is it and how can I tune into it becomes then the next biggest question. And unfortunately, like I said, there's no quick, there's no direct, you know, kind of three steps I can follow. And then I can determine what it is that's speaking. It is really the path 
of reconnecting with the full self, the physical needs, the emotional, unique emotional needs, and then the spiritual needs of being. Um, so to do that, the foundational practice that I referred to earlier that I think is, is, is so pivotal, it cannot be passed up, which is developing a, a new daily habit of consciousness of first and foremost, you know, observing yourself. I talk about self-observation or self-witnessing a lot. Um, notice. So now you've just heard, maybe you're listening to this podcast and you just heard me and you go on and on about this subconscious and this autopilot. And maybe you're not, maybe you're saying overwhelmingly, yes, I walk through life like groundhogs day and I repeat autopilot patterns. Great. You're sold. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not convinced that you're patterned and repetitive and habitual. So the first suggestion I always make is not to listen to me. Um, I actually don't make a suggestion to listen to anyone outside of ourselves. I think the major, you know, kind of emphasis I put through the work is reconnecting with that intuition, um, learning for yourself, figuring out what's of resonance to you and what isn't. So go see, go witness, go pay attention to yourself for the next two weeks, not more than a day, right? A couple weeks and just observe, you know, see how you imagine you're living your life and then look. See how conscious or unconscious you are. Check in with yourself. The way we know if we're conscious and if we're present is are we tuned into the moment around us to what's actually happening, right? Wherever you might be. So if you're unclear on if you're conscious or unconscious, I like to use, we all carry around cell phones. I know we do, most of us at this point at least. Set an alarm for random times throughout your day. And when that alarm goes off, Simply just note, where's my, simplest question is, where's my attention? Was I just lost in thought that I barely even heard the alarm go off? Okay, what was I thinking about? Was I thinking about yesterday's fight, tomorrow's issue, concern, et cetera? You know, was I just somewhere else and not really present or was I fully here? And if I'm not present, if the answer is no, I was completely unconscious, I don't know where I was. We want to begin to teach our brain now. This is where we can harness our brain's beautiful capacity to shift and change, and it's the neuroplasticity of it. We can actually learn how to be more conscious. And our access point in those moments, whether or not you set the alarm or just make a promise to yourself to build in one or two of these checkpoints throughout your day, is our senses, right? What am I seeing? What am I touching, feeling, smelling, tasting? Can I divert my attention to those sensory experiences, bringing me present into my physical body and then present and conscious in the present moment? Um, our goal is to increase the amount of time that we're aware of how conscious or unconscious we are and to increase then therefore the amount of time we're spent consciously. Because when we're conscious, a couple things become possible to us. First, we can become present to all of that patterning. It won't go away overnight, right? Even if you show up consciously with all these new habits you want to, you know, begin, that pull to that familiar is going to be there. You're going to hear the thoughts. You're going to see, right? And you're going to feel the drive to go back into that familiar. So consciousness allows us to be self-witnessing to see that conditioning that we're attempting to repeat day in and day out. It also over time increases the space where we can begin to make new choices, where we can begin to make new choices that lead to new ways of thinking, being, feeling that will feel uncomfortable as we begin to make those choices, but that over time will allow us to settle into transformation. And without consciousness, change is not possible. We will be that person who just continues to repeat the same patterns mm. probably until we no longer are here. That's an important part right there is that you can sometimes achieve your goal, but it will never stick if you don't know how you achieved it, why you achieved it, and be able to keep that then going for the rest of your life. So I would say for anybody who's just saying, I don't know if this is me, I don't know if I have a wounded self, if I have anything to do with this ego, it's just like you said, not for a day, but for two weeks, three weeks, what patterns do you see play out? Or you can even just think back, like what are one of your objectives and your goals in life? If your goal, we work a lot with people with 
uh, trying to lose weight, but they've already tried it for five years, 10 years, 20 years. They've lost some weight. They gained it back. Well, that's a pattern. And no, it doesn't necessarily mean it's your fault. What it means is that there's something else going on that you're not fully aware of. And it's not just about calories in, calories out. It's not just about exercise. It's about the nervous system. It's about hormones and how they affect glucose levels. And it's also about you. It's it's the actual spiritual, emotional side of you and how you view yourself. If you don't begin to view yourself differently, well, it's going to be difficult for things to change. So I would say, look at patterns, good and bad. Like, where are you best at? Where do you seem to you know, run into difficulties? Is it always at work? Because sometimes I always break it down into a few different categories, but sometimes your health is always great. Body's you know, at a good, healthy weight for you. Um, relationships are good, but career never seems to go well for you. Or there's no spiritual connectedness. It's like sometimes it's almost like a video game. We've got all these great potential in these areas, and then this one falls behind. And I've worked with some you know, uh, very high-powered uh, CEOs and billionaires, and they have these superpowers in business, but their relationships, not good, or their health, not good. And so, you know, it's kind of like, well, let's look at the patterns and let's only work necessarily on the things that we need to work on. But again, you need to want to do this and be self-aware in the first place. And that's that kind of consciousness. You don't need to know how to fix it yet, you, but you should be probably self-aware, I would say. Yeah, 100%. And, and something else I want to suggest is we I had a thought about this earlier, and it's, it's applying now too. don't imagine you're going to believe the new things about yourself initially as well. Right? Because so just using my kind of full circle example, I would have fought tooth and nail for that de- genetic determinism model. I would I already knew kind of within a self defined, you know, kind of lane, what I came to believe my body was capable of. There were certain ways that I had imagined by the time I was in my 30s when this happened for me that my body wasn't capable of looking or performing in those particular ways, right? Mm-hmm. So I w- when I began to do the work of consciousness and creating change through lifestyle-based interventions, I didn't believe that it was going to work. I didn't believe that it actually applied to me. I kind of was like, my subconscious is kind of rolling its eyes and saying, yeah, okay, Nicole, go do all these things. And then six months from now, when your body still looks the same, or you're still feeling the same, you'll just be further confirmed that it's not meant for you genetically. You just can't do this. And unfortunately the joke's on me because as I continue to evolve into healing, beliefs will change. However, Initially, they won't. We actually have a part of our our mind, our brain. It's called the reticular activating system that helps keep us locked in our beliefs. Essentially, it's our mind's filter. And we become a self-confirming machine. So whatever we believe about ourselves, again, usually these beliefs were formed very early, we kind of stuck ourselves because we have this part of our mind that's filtering the endless stimuli in any given moment that we can't attend to. And it's picking out the parts that it believes is applicable to us. So before I know it, I'm so solidified in my beliefs because they do reflect the reality I think I live every day. So I love that you mentioned the reticular activating system because a lot of people, they've heard about the law of attraction. They've studied the law of attraction and they said, well, I've tried it and it just didn't work for me. And one of the reasons why I think that is, is because they're trying to change their beliefs without actually believing it. So when they end up getting in that car accident or they meet the wrong person again, or they try the weight loss plan and it didn't work, it essentially does reinforce the beliefs that they have that it won't work for them. But the truth is, is that we are then just simply going back to our real subconscious beliefs to our wounded self, to our ego, and moving back to the familiar. So we start to make some progress, and then it just pulls us back to the familiar. So one of the things I like to say is, yes, our thoughts and our beliefs typically lead to our actions, and our actions then reinforce our thoughts and beliefs. But there's a way to short circuit that, and you mentioned it, and that is actually just to begin, even if you don't believe, just begin to do the work, take the actions. Because when you start to get small wins, you're like, whoa, what just happened there? oh, I made a little progress. Maybe, I don't believe this yet, but maybe this might work. And so we call it small wins. And again, we do it from a health-based perspective. A little less bloating today. Oh, a little bit better sleep. 
a little bit more hormonal balance. And then you just start to believe just a little bit more, which starts to what? Change your thoughts just a little bit more. It leads to slightly different feelings, which makes you then maybe want to take more of those specific actions. So I think there is a way to kind of short circuit that wire. And like you said, that neuroplasticity where you start to rewire things You're like, all right, I just like to say suspend disbelief for a moment. And of course, I didn't come up with that, but suspend disbelief. You don't have to believe, but just don't not believe either, right? Start to just say, okay, I'm going to work the process. And this has worked for many other people. You've worked with thousands of other people. We've worked with thousands of people with almost every single type of dis-ease you could think about. And it's worked for them. So it's at least possible that it may work for you as well. And that's all we want to start with. So... You can, of course, agree, disagree with that. And then I'd love to be able to move on to, so the first self-awareness, and then what's the second step? Yeah, absolutely. And and I agree with you. I, I talk a lot about what I call small daily promise with emphasis on small. Because I think a lot of times we, we short circuit our attempts to change when we overload right our, our subconscious, essentially. When we decide. So as a result of, you know, listening to a podcast or going to a seminar, we decide we're going to do five new things starting tomorrow. I actually don't think that that's maintainable. Change one new thing um, is going to challenge that subconscious. It's going to give us many opportunities to begin to make choices, even though that pull is there and is very strong. One new thing is going to be difficult enough. And what we're really looking for is not to do one thing or even five things, you know, for two weeks in a row. And then, you know, we, we white knuckle it and then we fall off our habit. Consistency is really what we're looking for. So emphasis on small, meaning keep it small. I actually have a very inspirational story um, of a community member who's also going to be included in my new book, whose incredible life transformation, which has now included her healing um, from incredibly you know, active and becoming debilitating symptoms of MS, of multiple sclerosis, started with her promise each and every day to drink one glass of water. That was it. She's obviously kept that promise to herself consistently created some other new daily habits that have helped facilitate or change. Um, but it really did start with one. So I think the small, the smallness of it is really important. Um, and I agree with you, you know, we have to make the choices. Don't even anticipate that disbelief thoughts, like you're very, you know, astutely uh, suggesting suspend disbelief. That doesn't mean that my subconscious isn't going to offer disbelieving thoughts or disproving thoughts. That just means I have to learn how to allow those thoughts to come in just as much as I didn't really have choice that they came in and then allow them to go as opposed to what most of us do. We hook them. As I say, we, once the thought is offered, right. You know, why are you doing this anyway? You're, this is never going to work for you. And now I ruminate on it. I repeat the whole time I'm doing the activity of how this isn't going to work for me. So sometimes what that means is noting, Oh, Thank you, disbelieving thought from my subconscious attempting to keep me safe. I'm not going to focus my attention on you. I'm going to maybe put my attention, oh, we can kill two birds with one stone, back on my senses, back into my physical body, back here in consciousness. Doesn't mean that that thought might not come back around, you know, disguise as something different. So just clarify that as well. Because I think a lot of times we're waiting for our subconscious to stop offering them. Um, so it's not that. We suspend it by allowing it to come and go. And that's really the relationship we want to cultivate with our whole internal world. I still have thoughts that are uncomfortable, that might be crazy sounding, you know, if and when I decide to share them, that maybe are downright mean. Does that make me any of a mean person, a crazy person, an uncomfortable person? I hope that I make choices outwardly that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, but I just use as an illustration that we can't control our thoughts. Our thoughts don't make us a good or bad person. Um, so thoughts of disbelief will be there as you're attempting to create change. It doesn't mean that you have to continue to endorse them by paying too much attention to them. Yeah. So we become conscious. Okay. No, I was just going to say, I, lo I, I love that because I, I basically, I learned the same thing. It's like, you're never going to be able to completely get rid of the thoughts. You'll have less of them most likely as you begin to move through them. But those thoughts are there trying to keep you safe. So to thank your subconscious is just such a, it's, it's more of a parasympathetic based activity. You don't have to fight against it. You simply allow it to be, especially when meditating and then, you know, thank it for bringing that up and, and decide, but you know, you're, you're making a different choice, you know, but thanking that subconscious. And the other thing you mentioned, which is really important is going back to your self-awareness, know where you're at, 
you know, this person that you worked with, with MS, it was enough for them to make the one conscious change of having a glass of water a day. So it's kind of like, it's knowing where you're at, meeting yourself where you're at and understanding that in a month from now, you'll be in a different spot and you'll be able to do more then. We always overestimate, I love this quote, we overestimate what we can do in the short term and underestimate what we can do in the long term, right? So everybody wants to make this huge change today. Well, okay, you can attempt that. Most likely you'll be back here tomorrow or next week. Or you can begin to at least do one thing that you know has to be done in order to heal. And if you are dehydrated with an autoimmune-based issue, hydration is a great first place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, we are creatures of immediacy. And a lot of times we become compelled to create change very understandably when we're uncomfortable. And for some of us, the discomfort is incredible. So it's really understandable as a human that the way our mind logically attempts to work is, well, five new things gets me to feel better quicker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just want to normalize those of us who have tried, you know, to, to create incredible top to bottom change overnight and, you know, attempted to write too many things on that to-do list. You know, I believe it really is a testament to the amount of pain that that person and all of us are in, in those moments where the quickest path is to do a lot at once um, so that we can feel better ultimately at some later time. However, it's just, it's not sustainable. Change is difficult to begin with. Um, that pull to go back to that familiar is going to be there um, and learning how to maintain consistency for the amount of time that it takes some of our systems to rebalance. For me, being as dissociated as I was, so the way I dealt with always something, that stress overwhelm in childhood was I dissociated, I detached from myself. So I was living, one might say, the opposite of consciously pretty much 24 hours of each and every day. So I'm sharing that because for me, it took me, you know, significant amount of time, even the better part of a year of my initial healing journey, just to work on consciousness, just to teach my body how to enter the present moment, to teach my body that the present moment was safe enough to enter. So that one small daily promise of which for me just started the same way I'm suggesting pay attention to how unconscious you are and when you can enter consciousness in that moment. And so that was my small daily promise for the better part of a year until my body actually started. Right. So 30 some years of disbalance, imbalance took time before my body began to be able to integrate and live and embody that change before I began to then feel differently, think differently as a result. And humans, like I said, especially humans in pain, we are driven to that immediacy. We want the quickest way to feel better. And now many of us live in a virtual age where relief is possible immediately, if not sooner. So that's just something that I think we all contend with. And it does feel like it's gonna take longer to get there to feel better when we do consider implementing these small changes like you and I are suggesting, though consistency and change is really what we need to maintain. Yeah. So let's talk about that, that change now, because I, I want people, I always want to give people in every podcast, one big takeaway, not 15 big takeaways, but one big takeaway. So we know that there is the, uh, there is the, the programming that we have as a child, good and bad, right? It's not all bad. There's some good in there. We have the ego. We have these patterns we've created. The first step is becoming conscious, self-aware that this is even a real thing. And then the next step that you have in this model of a three-part step is, is realizing the pattern. And that's, that's the triggers that we have because we want to work on something. If we can change those actions, well, then we can, we can have a different life, right? So we have to change something in order to make change in our life. So could you talk a little bit about, so now we're more self-aware. We know that this exists. Now we need to, we need to figure out, well, where does this show up in our life? Can you a little bit about, talk a little bit about how these triggers come about, like how we can now we're aware, but how can we be aware of what needs to be changed? So, uh, outside of, so when you become self-witnessing, self-observational, likely you'll see maybe some habits, some patterns, you know, some ways of being, oh, I'm someone who, you know, my morning feels crazy and I want a morning routine, right? So some of these are going to be really behavioral. You know, you'll start to see, I want to make new nutritional choices or I need to sleep a bit more differently or stress, right? 
a lot of times in the emotional area, the way we can start to understand what's being stored in our subconscious. So it's our habits, it's our patterns. And it's kind of, I want to go back to something you and I were referencing earlier. It's the wounding that occurs in all of those moments in childhood where we didn't feel seen, heard, the ability to authentically express. That caused some degree of childhood pain, of childhood wounding. Um, and we, of course, at that time, we adapt it somehow. We either, you know, kind of explained away our need. Maybe we, we, we went outward. We did something external, right? We kicked, we screamed, we yelled. We became the kid that, you know, when they're upset, we like screamed around the house. Um, we might've done what I did, dissociated. You didn't even know I was upset. I just kind of like, wasn't there in the room, you know? So that is part of what's in our subconscious as well. Um, and so the way that presents itself in adulthood is typically around moments where one might say we're emotionally activated, a common word that is used is we're triggered when we're having an emotional experience that feels greater to some extent, some of it, a very great extent than the precipitating event. And we can start to sense and observe and witness themes in those areas too. And that can help us give clues into what that earliest wounding is. So for me, a common example, and I talk about it in the context, I often share a, um, you know, things that would come up in terms of dishes in the house and with me and my partner, who's cleaning the dishes. This is not a conversation on division of labor in the household. I mean, this would be text exchanges, you know, the, the amount of time between a response I got and a theme that would come up in my mind, the way I made sense of events, a patterned language that I would hear my subconscious offer me is some version of I'm not considered. And I would live my life and vet daily experiences through a lens that my particular activating system was assisting to create an experience that further confirmed how not considered I was. And like I said, this could span from me having to do the dishes a little bit more than my partner did the dishes. So that was a moment of her not considering me and I had to do the dishes. So again, right, she didn't text me back when I felt she should. Does she not know what's going on in my life? Oh, all roads began to lead to some version of I'm not considered. And so for me in those moments, I would have an emotional reaction. Sometimes it looked like, being mad outwardly, telling her how inconsiderate she was and she doesn't care about me or the relationship. And maybe I'd tear around the house angrily. And sometimes I would do, you know, what my mom modeled for me. I would remove myself emotionally. I'd become a ghost. I would not really speak to her. What's wrong? Nothing. I, you know, kind of really remove. For me, I came to realize I was having a big emotion about what? About dishes, about return of text about, I mean, really the list went on, Stephen. And when I dove into why was this, why was I becoming so emotional? I understood the meaning that I was assigning and the role that meaning was playing because now it really wasn't the dish that was left in the sink. It was the fact that this dish came to mean how not considered I was by one of the people that I care most about and hope I'm considered most from. And then as I saw how repetitive that was, I began to call that into question. Sometimes I would consider strangers weren't considering me. Well, why would they, right? So I started to see and understand for me that that narrative was being driven from a deeper place. And for me, you know, with the awarenesses that I have about my childhood, even though I do lack a lot of actual memories about my childhood, um, the dissociative state for many of us results in having few what we call autobiographical, or I can't remember, like visually remember my childhood. And I'll get asked when I talk about that, well, can I still heal? You know, this whole talk you and I've been having is about understanding these past things. What if I don't know? What if when I look back at the blank movie screen, yeah. my response is always the same. You're living them. So for me, that childhood wounding, I can't think back in time and, and remember instances where my mom didn't allow me to feel or her way of being didn't allow me to feel considered in that moment. I couldn't give you a litany of what they were, yet I can understand that something like that happened. Because why is every instance at every turn now making me feel that I'm not considered, even when logically it doesn't feel like it applies? So emotionally and spiritually, you know, our habits, 
shifts, changes, you know, and those patternings, we can observe those. Some of us that we have more access to those and we know logically what we want to change. When we dive into our spiritual and emotional worlds, a lot of times what we are wanting to look to in terms of patterns are those emotional activated moments. And I'm here to offer that typically you'll start to find some patterns, some similar narrative, maybe even some similar feeling that's driving it that just might, if you are someone who remembers enough of childhood or has enough of a sense of what it was or wasn't like for you, you might see kind of the origin of those. Yeah, it's nice to hear too that even if you can't if you can't recall those memories. Uh, that you're still able to heal because you do see the pattern showing up now as an adult. And one line that you've used before that really brought it home for me and made the connection was right now as an adult, you're having a disproportional reaction to something trivial because that's what we do. Like it just like you for the, di- the dishes aren't done. Well, it, I mean, just if you just look as an outsider, it's nice to be able to look at from a third party they're just dishes and they weren't clean. And we also don't know what's necessarily going on with the other person. Maybe they got a call. Maybe they had their own thing going on and they just didn't get to it yet. Maybe they were planning to do it five minutes after you started it. So it's a nicer way to look at it. Like we don't necessarily know what's going on with the other person, but we know what's going on right now inside of us. So I, I mean, I for sure have recognized a lot of my own triggers. I don't think I have a lot of what you call an autobiographical recall of those from a visual based perspective. I, I have like maybe like three or four specific memories. And okay, you can work on those, you know, specifically as well. And it's just like, it's also nice to know that for many people, not all, but many people, your parents, your community, your grandparents, the people that you trusted, they weren't necessarily trying to do anything wrong to you or bad to you. They were handling it the best that they knew how. But now as an adult, you get to make your own choices, have your own thoughts. So going through that, I think it can be very empowering. And then also the one thing I, once you recognize the disproportional reaction to something small, okay, well, that's what we need to work on. Even if you believe you're right, it's still affecting you. It's kind of like um, that, that reaction is the poison meant for someone else that you're drinking yourself, right? So like, that's the thing is like, it's hurting you more than it's hurting anybody else. And it's affecting then the other person too, because it's your kind of bringing that, uh, that venom out to everyone. So I would say that's a good first place to start, right? That's like, okay, well, why? And you don't have to figure it out right away, but begin to ask yourself why. And we'll get into the programs that you offer as well that can kind of help uh, develop that. But there's a last part. There's a third part to this that you talk about, it's, it's really then speaking to yourself. And you kind of talked about it already. How do you begin that, that healing process then? Yeah, so the, the third part, once we become you know, self-witnessing, self-observational, you know, using our habits, our patterns, our emotional states of you know, activation um, to see you know, the, essentially what we're doing now is we're witnessing the, our conditioning and the way and the patterned way that's stored in our subconscious of being. At the same time, we're helping our brain along by firing up the prefrontal cortex and the seat of consciousness so that we can begin to make new choices. So the third step, and this is, I call it kind of like an individualized menu is creating change, you know, is what are we going to do? And essentially the, the very kind of overarching concept that I like to refer to is, is reparenting is learning the best way to be connected to identify and meet our needs in those three areas, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And I call it a menu because it's going to look different. This is why I don't believe in universal healing. And back to something you talked about in the beginning, um, you know, acknowledging that the, the power of working with humans that are individual and the reality that many of these programs, the way science quote unquote is studied and, and, you know, experimentation has to occur. It really strips people of their individuality um, in my opinion, in a lot of problematic ways. And it tries to make us, you know, kind of this universalized one size fits all model because that's the only way we can study science. But I think it does do a disservice Um, for the individual. So I say that to say um, there is no universal way that each of us need to repair it because our needs are different. Our needs are ever evolving. And my needs, even though I am working to being more connected to my physical, emotional, and spiritual self so that I can continue to make choices that are in alignment with that self, I still have hopefully many years, you know, that I will be here physically present on this earth plane, living life, evolving and changing. So another reason why 
I don't believe, unfortunately, though I desperately wanted to in this idea of doneness and maturity. You know, I just, I'm completed now. I don't think that's the case. I think what our goal is to connect with that intuitive wisdom so that we can continue to navigate a variable human existence that each of us will have. So the next kind of major category of self-healing of tools is going to look different and it's going to be, you know, okay, how do I create change then in the areas that I need to? So to speak to your point, I might have some habits and there might be some ways that I tend to certain emotions that I think are helping me and are beneficial. And I might not create change in those areas though, as a result of becoming conscious and you know, becoming more self-witnessing, I might start to see the areas where I can learn some new tools emotionally, spiritually. And some of us might have to learn a different way to take care of our actual physical bodies as well um, to begin to shift those imbalances and actually create change. So that big category is what I call reparenting. Um, Again, it looks different for each of us and it comes as a result of those first two stages. And I'm here to then say you know, those first two stages are so foundational and important that I do get a lot of, well, I just want to repair it because I know that I have to like get better and kind of like what we were talking about earlier, right? I just want to get to the immediate problem. We're not going to be able to repair it and make new choices. See all this, all this is connected unless I'm conscious in those moments to make new choices, unless I'm conscious to my feelings, say, to learn how to identify when I'm having one and to learn how to navigate that in a new way. I need to be conscious to my spiritual self and to it giving me those pings, right? That information that we wanted to know earlier, is this the right partner for me? Is this the right direction in life for me? We have to be able to tune into those spiritual pings in real time or when they're occurring for us. So that third stage, in my opinion, is a lifelong journey um, for most of us. And it's really about just remaining connected to that inner wisdom um, that will help guide us as circumstances shift and change around us for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, especially listening um, to your work in this show, it's that, you know, there's this self-actualization that we all hope to get to, which is a never-ending Uh, process of growth. You know, it's like, okay, well, wherever we are today, there's still more to learn. There's still more to experiment with. And however you view life, well, you know, this is your life meant living. This is, this is what you're supposed to be enjoying, enjoying the journey. And it's difficult to enjoy the journey. If you just keep you finding yourself in these patterns, because the pattern may go away because you look at it, you assess it Oh, three months later, there it is. It's like three or four times a year. Well, that's still something that you need to work on, even if it only pops up three or four times a year. And I think eventually, and I'm starting to get there because I'm by no means perfect, is that I'm not looking at it at I need to conquer anything. Like this isn't me trying to best one more specific thing in my life. It's like, okay, this is something that I really want to work with, that I want to know maybe where it came from, if possible. If not, what is it leading to? And um, how would I be better if I wasn't struggling with this specific thing? So now it's like, it's a way of looking at my life that I don't even need to be perfect because I don't think that there is a perfection. It's more of a knowing us, right? It's finding ourselves, who we really are and how we'll be able to then work with that. And so that's why, you know, we, we use the de-stress protocol. It's diet, it's exercise, stress reduction, tox removal, rest, emotional balance, science-backed supplements and um, success mindset. But that is wildly different for each individual based on what they're going through. But I think what you're saying too is there's also a foundation, meaning like every, you know, it's not Groundhog Day every day, right? It's like it is realizing that there is a specific structure to rewiring the mind. There's a specific structure, a foundation to all diets, and then it's bio individualized for the person. So I'd love to hear more about now, you know, so we in the de stress protocol, it's emotional balance, it's success mindset, and it's lowering stress. That's a big part of it. So, how do you teach those things in your work? And I know that you said you have a book coming out, but you also have programs that teach this to people. So, could you explain? the foundation of those that all people need to know and then how it can be individualized for them. Yeah, absolutely. So foundation, no matter, I mean, at this point every day, essentially Steven, I put out free content on Instagram. So whether or not you're just consuming Instagram or you're in my membership or considering or pre-sale my book, the first conversation that you and I keep coming back to is going to be one of consciousness. You know, so many of us are living unconsciously or 
feeling disempowered and reactive as a result of it and, you know, feeling just downright stuck in our life. So any conversation, any of the work that, you know, you're going to hear coming from me, it's really going to be harnessing the incredible transformative power of, of consciousness. And, and then, you know, whether or not we're talking about um, most frequently because we are interpersonal creatures, um, you know, aspects of our interpersonal relating through reparenting, through shifting from what I call trauma bonds, which are really just an extension of everything you and I have been talking about, those earliest models of relationships that, the, you know, my theory being you repeat them, you repeat them, you, you know, interact with people, romantic friendships, you know, family members in more or less the same way. You're always the helper. You're always a caretaker. Um, so a lot of us, you know, begin to do the work, you know, of healing through our relationships, through healing first and foremost, the relationship with ourself. Um, so then that looks, you know, again, at what are your self care behaviors? How do you care for the physical, emotional self? Um, talking about all of those interventions, um, nervous system regulation is often a, a point of topic. Again, whether you're in the circle and we're having a, a breath work month with a breath work practitioner coming in, or you're hearing me just talk about learning how to train your body to breathe from the belly. I mean, it can be as simple though, as difficult as I know my physiology, my posture made it really hard for me to learn how to harness the power of the breath. Though the power of the breath is something we do each and every day. So typically most of us humans, you know, when we're talking about our body component, we can learn some new habits that help balance our bodies a bit better, whether it's nutrition, um, urging people to learn how to connect with their body, learn its cues about when it's hungry, when it's full, tune into how you feel when you eat the pizza versus, you know, the, the steak or the, you know, that the apple, you know, ask your, your body is giving you signals. You might not even be aware of it. I know I wasn't, I'm still learning to ask my body when it's hungry, to know when it's hungry or if it's stressed or to, you know, really know how to that food makes me feel. Um, so some of us want to begin to explore nutritional choices. I think sleep is a common one. Um, you know, anyone listening, just be aware of how, how you're sleeping. If you're sleeping, how many hours, um, you know, starting to, you know, I'm sure you do a lot of this work. Sleep is so incredibly important and so underrated. And un um the at your feel again you know how do you feel in your body okay then dive into the body stuff can you tweak any of those areas i just mentioned emotionally how connected do you feel to your emotions right and that'll give you direction in terms of probably you need to learn some new emotional regulation tools i myself was one of those people so really we want to observe so that we can get clarity like you were offering earlier into the areas that you know we want to shift or change some habits typically we're probably going to be doing some work in terms of relationship with self first meeting our own needs learning how for many of us and then extending that because that does extend outward to our relationships as we learn how to care for ourselves, we learn how to show up more authentically to our relationships we learned how to hold space to hear what they think, what they feel, to allow them to express too. Um, so I'm a big believer in, you know, in I'm not individualistic by any means. I think a lot of times my work is misinterpreted that I do mean do the work alone, sequester yourself off from all their humans. Absolutely not. I do know though that the how how I relate to myself and how I observe other people relating to themselves is does carry an impact to how they relate in relationships. So self-healing really does heal our relationships and then heal our society. So I know I'm answering pretty generally because um, I want to give people the flexibility to kind of find their shoot in terms of, okay, is it the physical body I want to start with? Typically I do suggest foundationally we make sure our body is balanced because something you and I both referenced earlier, an imbalanced body is going to continue to send those messages of imbalance into our mind. Um, and it's, it's only going to go so far. So if we're trying to, you know, install, you know, peace and embody peace and balance in our mind, if our body is sending a signal to our mind that it's constantly waiting for the next threat. It's not gonna, it's not gonna work. So 
I guess kind of if we want to talk about a pyramid, you know, outside of consciousness, which I think is the foundation of all things, um, the next priority, especially if you're someone who was identifying with those states of nervous system activation that I talked about earlier, feeling hypervigilant, on edge, always something, if you will, and or completely detached, dissociated, and like I have no feelings, um, we probably want to do some of that physiological balancing through nutrition, stress management, sleep, and of course, nervous system work. And then that will continue to create the foundation to do, now I can begin to work maybe on my triggers in relationships or my emotional activation, because now my body, I'm starting to feel a little bit more empowered. Mm -hmm. I know that the next time that trigger comes up, because it will, and my subconscious tells me I'm not considered and tries to throw me into that emotional tizzy, I can remain conscious enough to maybe do some breath work to help bring my body down so that then I can continue to make a new choice in how I navigate that. So to simplify on the foundation of consciousness, we probably next, most of us want to address our physiological bodies, making sure that we can build the practices that over time will lead us in that more balanced direction. And then we can begin to do the deeper inner child wounding work and start to shift us out of those more ego driven, emotionally driven um, reactions. And that will come in time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's just, it, it is a little bit easier working in the body, in my opinion, too, figuring out what the specific issues are, the imbalances, whether it be deficiencies or toxicities, and then having a clear mind to then do this very important work. I mean, if you're low thyroid or if you're high cortisol, whatever it might be, you can correct those. And so you don't have the brain fog. You don't feel like you never wake up without caffeine. It's all of those different things. So um, I really believe in the interconnection between the two, without a doubt. So I know your when when does your book debut? I'd love to be able to help uh, share that too with with our community. So how far from now? Absolutely, it feels like forever. Yet <laughs> right around the corner, it's been a while. Uh, I think like two years in progress now. The official release release date is March 9th, um, twenty twenty one. So like five months from now. However, it is on pre-sale now, um, definitely in the U.S. and some other um, countries. It's up all of the links in my bio at my Instagram if you want to check that out, the .holistic.psychologist. Um, though the book will officially live in the world March 9th, and I can't wait because it's finally you know, outside of the squares that I've been putting out every day for the last two years on Instagram, it's finally like start to finish really this whole theory of holistic wellness. Um, and it has a lot of, you know, tips and daily exercise and practices to kind of for the first time, give people the start to finish kind of roadmap of all things self healing in a way that you know, while Instagram has been an amazing tool, um, this will really allow it to live in one place and to have the depth of discussion and science and framework um, that I think a lot of us are interested in. It's amazing. What's the name of it? It's called How to Do the Work. How to Do the Work. Fantastic. Well, good. I look forward to purchasing a copy myself and uh, for many other people in the practice as well. It was a pleasure having you on here today. Uh, what is that Instagram handle again where people can find you? Absolutely. So it, I always shout out Instagram, Stephen, because I'm practically on there day in and day out. I'm sharing my own healing journey. And we also have a really incredible community of self healers. So people quite literally from around the world also doing the work. Um, I shout out the community in particular, because that was a really big driving force for my own journey onto the online world, um, not having any idea of how big the community would indeed end up being. Um, though I know a lot of us, you know, feel certain levels of disconnection and misunderstanding. So having people I think who understand, who relate, who resonate and who are doing the same work is so impactful in our journey. So it's the dot holistic dot psychologist over at Instagram. I also have a link tree um, posted up in the bio that will direct everyone. So outside of the book, um, I have a freebie that comes when you sign up for my email list. Um, it's a set of journal prompts for a journaling technique um, that really has helped me create consciousness and intention to change. It's called the Future Self Journal. So if you want to, anyone listening wants to sign up, um, probably in the next month, actually, I have a new updated version of that getting ready to release as well, and that will go out. So the, the Instagram is really the, the jump off point, the dot holistic dot psychologist. So come over, join me, join the community. And obviously, I put out content each and every day, you know, in these areas that you and I talked about. 
Excellent. Well, you shared a lot of that today, so I very much appreciate that. A lot of big takeaways. And we will link up your uh, virtual home, your Instagram and social media at today's show notes, as well as your book. Uh, This will probably debut in about a month or so. So that new future self journal, those pages will already be there. Uh, Once again, thank you, Dr. Nicole LaPera. Appreciate having you on here today. Thank you so much, Stephen, for sharing again, your time, your energy and your community. It's really, I love connecting with like-minded people. So thank you. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you. And I mean that I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. You can find podcast specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.